Business over drinks. Business over drinks. This is Dave and Tom. This is business over drinks. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Business Over Drinks. My name is Tung and I'm calling in from Singapore. Hey, hey, hey. This is David. Welcome to Business Over Drinks. Calling in from Brisbane, Australia. How are you doing? Not too bad, man. Not too bad. We've got a special episode. It's the 9th of uh, August, which is National Day in Singapore. So it's a holiday for me, but I've decided I want to do a podcast because we've got a really special guest. And this was one of the days she was free. Every other day, she said, no, she can't be bothered. So yeah, that's the real reason good. why you're, you're yeah, doing basically. podcasts on a holiday. Yeah, basically, that's the only reason. Otherwise, <laughs> nah, I'd be sleeping right now. So we've got a really special guest. So we've got Amanda Kua. I got it right. Who is the founder and CEO of Backscoop. So Backscoop is a daily free newsletter that makes you find easy to learn about everything Southeast Asian business and startup. So that's kind of cool. So it was launched actually quite recently, actually late last year, which is in 2001, if I'm not wrong. And it's already read by thousands of people. So anywhere from um, top founders, execs, VCs, and startup operators. I read it as well. So you know that the readership is really cool. Uh, born and raised in the Philippines, Amanda is, and drumroll please, she's 20 years old. So she's really young and it's very irritating that she's doing really well. And also, this is also previously the first employee at the YC Back Ed Tech Avion School, which I know. Oddly enough. Um, so yeah, we're going to talk about everything back school, being 20 years old and kind of like running a company, putting basically your entire life on hold so that you can run something successfully, exit at multi-million dollar uh, valuations and then give us some money. Man, that's, when I was 20 years old, I was watching Naruto on YouTube until I just passed out. <laughs> that was my major accomplishment at 20. So well done. Um, I'm not even big. I'm not even like uh, remotely surprised, Dave. Amanda, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. Super excited to have business over drinks. A very different kind of podcast. <laughs> very I, different. I, I, <laughs> oh, it's, it's not that different. I don't know. I just felt like that was like, oh, it's what did I sign up for? I didn't read the fine print. <laughs> well enough. Um, no, that's that's how most of our guests feel. Uh, I they don't change their mind, but too late. We've already got them. Um, so, um, anyway, what we usually do, and I think we've got to do a special one today is we introduce the drinks that we're having. So David, do you want to tell everyone what you're drinking? Yeah. So our drinks were, we'd like to give a big thanks to the, the crew at Winesmiths for providing us some um, organic alcohol. So this is the first time I've ever tried organic alcohol and, uh, I've got Chardonnay. Do you have Chardonnay as well, Tone? No, I'm drinking their Cabernet. So they gave us a bunch of different wines to try. So I'm drinking their Cabernet. Um, it's delicious. Um, I'll be very honest with you. I've drunk a lot of organic wine before and I'm not a massive fan. This is the best tasting organic wine I've ever had. I know that sounds like an ad, but it's not. I told everybody this off camera too. I really like it. Yeah, I'm not an expert in organic wine, but I spoke to a, I went on a wine tour once. And it was telling us about um, the benefits of organic wine, especially the way they they uh, get the grapes and, and so forth, it's just a much healthier process, less less risky, according to him. Um, but yeah, less so it. It. a yeah. lot less additives to the wine, uh, so it's it's really cool. Amanda, I can see you're drinking what I assume is water, or is that vodka? I don't know. I, I'm I not had I had water earlier, and now I'm drinking kombucha. So alternating between Whoa. the two now. <laughs> you, you're the second guest this year who's had kombucha. Yeah, is it the same flavor? This one is peach flavor. Oh, nice. Nice. And we'll, <laughs> there's a trend. There's a trend happening and we're, we're, we're far behind, David. We're far well, behind. What, what brand of kombucha is? We'll, we'll put a link to all our drinks in the show notes, by the way. Remedy kombucha. Remedy kombucha. Remedy kombucha. Got it. Okay. Awesome. So anyway, we're going to jump straight into it, Amanda, but at any time, just feel free to basically tell us to shut up or ask us questions as well. Yeah. Uh, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't really like to stand in ceremony in this podcast. I so do. anyway, um, <laughs> why don't you tell us what drove you to start Backscoop at such a young age? Were you 19 or were you 20 when you started it? I was 19 when I started. Um, so oh, 2020. God, I, was 19, I, wasn't doing <laughs> I think, honestly, I don't think. I ever set out to do this at all, um, except more if I was forced to by circumstance. 
so in 2020, I graduated from high school, uh, studied really hard in high school. I was pretty much a nerd. I was always really quiet. Um, but then when the pandemic came and it was time to accept my college offers, I felt like I wouldn't get that benefit um, from going to college, you know, the academic benefit, the social benefit, and even the fun benefit. You're not going to get any of that online on Zoom. So I thought, okay, let's take a year off and figure out something else to do because nothing's going to be good about going to university on Zoom. I mean, if you guys think about university days, I don't think you could have translated any of that to like an online experience on Zoom. <laughs> Probably not. I didn't know what we, we barely had the internet when I went to university. I remember going to class once. I was so late. And then my friend and I, we just looked at the door and we went, no, let's just go that drinking. <laughs> we, just we didn't go to class yeah i did i did that many times i did that many times i feel like we're we're not setting a good example for people amanda's saying hey drop i just didn't want to do any work i just wanted to do my own thing uh on <laughs> university sucks and so, dave and i talk about drinking <laughs> so back scoop so you you uh you felt like you so you you were you didn't want to do zoom before we get into the origin stories of Backscoop, I'm curious though, because me as someone who grew up in a Filipino household, I feel like there's a lot of, if you want to do something out of the ordinary, there's a lot of fear, there's a lot of concern from parents who, who know, who have good intentions. Did you get that at all? Yeah, I mean, that's spot on. I think my parents were kind of on board with it because, you know, it was a pandemic and then going to university and going to university online for the first time, I think that was foreign for everybody. So taking a year off was kind of acceptable at that time. But then it was really, I mean, the, the heat was turning up for me to find something worthwhile to do while I was taking a year off and show them I was not a bum. <laughs> so I think that, that was the case. So I tried to find something to do for the next few months. And then I stumbled upon a company I mentioned earlier um, yeah. Avian School and then I ended up working there instead as their first employee so then I got you know something worthwhile to do during the pandemic oh no that's really interesting so then you 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 left Avian School about a year later I assume because in 2020 right in 2021 but like why newsletters I mean we you, you and I had a discussion about this before the cameras were turned on right but like why newsletters why was that the one thing you want to jump in because it's not common. It's still not like super mainstream, to be honest. I guess for me, like I worked at Avian School for over a year and then it was a Philippine startup. I was able to work in the Philippine startup industry in 2020 when things were just about to really turn up um, and grow a lot faster. So I basically got a front seat and is seeing um, all of the companies popping out in the Philippines, all of the girls coming out of Southeast Asia um, and as part of my job and just out of personal curiosity, I kept up with the news in Southeast Asian tech all the time. And one of the things that I felt really tough, uh, felt was really tough was keeping up with Southeast Asian tech. I'd always have to refresh God knows how many sites, um, refresh LinkedIn and everything else so many times. Um, and you know, I would still miss out on companies and I felt like it was so tiring to just refresh everything. And one of the other things I did outside my job was to read, read a lot. So I read a lot of books, but I think the key thing was I read newsletters every single day as part of my routine. So I'd get up um, and as part of my daily routine, I'd read newsletters for like 30 minutes every single day, Monday to Friday, um, right before getting to work. So I already liked newsletters so much um, at the time. So when I really felt like, okay, um, startup news is really tough to deal with. There's no easy way to keep up. Um, and the second thing that I felt like was, you know, when you look at the kind of startup news coming out, it was really only Singapore um, and Indonesia that were the mature startup ecosystems. These were the news articles that were coming out all the time. But, you know, being in the Philippine startup ecosystem, I saw how fast it was growing. I knew how many companies were popping up. And I told myself, like, hey, if it's really hard to keep up now, when it's only these two countries that are, quote unquote, the developed startup ecosystems, so what's going to happen when the Philippines becomes developed, when all these other company, I mean, countries like Malaysia, Thailand, all become developed, nobody's going to be able to keep up with startup news anymore. So I put two and two together. Okay, it's hard to keep up with the news in Southeast Asian tech. And it's 
going to be an even bigger problem, then we need a solution. And to me, since I read newsletters all the time, I thought maybe we can try starting a newsletter because people are, you know, reading newsletters for news to keep up with the daily news. Why don't we use that to keep up with Southeast Asian tech? And it's pretty easy to start. It's cheap to start. So why don't I just try it out? So I think that's really how it started. Oh, so jealous. Look, when I try something, it normally just fails just uh, <laughs> <laughs> within, not, not, not within weeks, but within years. Like it just it drags on. But so, um, just a little background, Amanda. So David has actually um, published a couple of books. He's like a published author. He's like quite successful with some of his stuff. So he keeps on doing this in order to gain like this weird uh, online sympathy thing. This is like a really weird, it's a, it's a compulsion. <laughs> I noticed that. I noticed that. But no, yeah, but I want people to feel sorry for me. So what do you, like, uh, I'm really curious. So how did you first start marketing this newsletter? I mean, do you mind me asking what kind of numbers you are, you have today when it, ter- when it comes to your newsletter? Yeah, we have 6,000 subscribers right now. Yep. And how did you start with your first, first hundred? So the first hundred, those are really just, you know, the people I was super close to, so like my best friends, my inner circle of friends, family and friends, my coworkers. Those were like the first hundred people. I remember the first day that um, Backscoop was launched. It was just a web page where you could sign up, nothing else. Um, no social media, you know, pages were active or anything like that where we were actively posting. Um, it was just the landing page. And I just messaged a couple of friends like, hey, I'm starting this newsletter on Southeast Asian tech. Um, maybe you could subscribe. It's free. And those are the first hundred people, just a few people who knew what I was up to and a few people I messaged on like Facebook. You know, a hundred people. I think if I started something, I'd get maybe 12 and like three of that would be family. And then I would be I mean, that they won't sign up. What um, scenes on you as well. <laughs> I mean, a bunch of people scene zoned me. A bunch of people also asked me, is this a scam? Did you get hacked? And I was like, no, I'm just starting a newsletter. <laughs> so obviously you had to message way more than 100 people. But, you know, it just starts with the people who you're friends with um, on Facebook, maybe a few groups that you're in um, and active in. So it starts okay, with the so inner I'm gonna, circle. I'm going to make a big assumption here that you don't have a massive budget to play with, right? Um, yeah. How do you plan to sustain growth? Because from 100 to 6,000 is not a small feat. How do you plan to sustain growth? I think, you know, with us right now, one of the big things we're focusing on is monetization. So we're monetizing the newsletter and putting in ads. Um, so that's one way we're going to be able to get a bit more cash, reinvest um, into growth. But I think what's more interesting is like, how do you develop sustainable um, growth strategies? So I think coming from you know, a really early stage startup, I got to understand a bit more about growth um, there. So for me, I just doubled down on what works. And at first, I experimented with a couple different ways um, to do it for free, to find out how we can get subscribers for free. And for me, what's worked the most is LinkedIn. So that's just reaching out to a couple of people on LinkedIn, making posts on LinkedIn on our Backscoop LinkedIn page, um, sharing and liking those posts and that's how it's been able to grow so much more um, over the past a few months because that 6,000 subscribers, none of those are paid ads. Everything there is mostly pretty much just LinkedIn. Um, well, so so everything is organic growth? Through, yep, mainly through everything LinkedIn. is organic. Yeah, mainly through LinkedIn, 6,000 people. And, and is it mainly, the? do you write most of the content or is it regurgitated content? For me, I write the, most of the content. So everything on the newsletter is typed um, by me. So we basically have a couple of articles. I write all of them. Then we add a couple of links there. I still have to type in like the titles for the links and stuff like that and then hyperlink it. So yeah, I write everything there um, every day. I write Monday to Thursday every week. Mm, awesome. No, th- so that's quite impressive, right? Because I think um, you actually just recovered from COVID very recently, right? Yeah, I had COVID like three, four weeks ago. I think three. <laughs> no, that's that's really interesting because I think when you have COVID, you, like at least my experience was you, you, you're kind of out, you're out for a little bit. It wasn't that long. For me, it was a couple of days, but like I really couldn't do anything for a couple of days. Or I couldn't publish for a week. Sorry? You couldn't publish for a week. You couldn't publish for a week. 
Yeah, I couldn't publish for a week. First time I didn't publish. So I'd been very consistent with my publishing schedule until I got COVID and I was out for an entire week. <laughs> no, but like how, how did how did that how did you how did that make you feel like really honestly? Because when I couldn't work for two days and like we were pushing deadlines and everyone was like messaging me and asking me stuff. I lit for me at least because my, my team was they knew I had COVID, so they were trying to message me, but there were a lot of things that were really urgent and I couldn't respond because I literally tried to type a message and I pass out. Like the medication yeah. just make me pass out. I know how, how it made me feel, like in terms of just actually just trying to get uh, get my mind around it, right? But did you did you did you have any I wouldn't say panic, but maybe were you stressed out by that? Like what was what were you what were you thinking? What was your mind like during that that one week where you were not able to do anything. I think we could start with how it felt for me to have COVID. So I think um, the first day or two was still the weekend. So that's when you don't know you have COVID, but then you're starting to get the symptoms. But then the first day uh-huh. I actually felt the symptoms, that was Monday when I had to start writing. But that day I had a pounding headache. And even if I tried to eat, like I'd have to use the only strength remaining in my body, which is on my arms to sort of scoot myself off the bed and support my body to like fall into the ground gracefully. (laughs) So I really couldn't do anything. Um, And so the hours would go by in the day and I was trying to take medicine and I was trying to sleep. And I thought, okay, maybe at the end of the day I can write. Because I usually write towards the end of the day. And you feel like that slowing amount of pressure because you know that time is ticking. It's like, okay, it's almost the end of the day. It's when you're usually writing. Okay, you haven't written yet. <laughs> and then um, at the same time, you're slowly starting to accept that you cannot do the work. And I think it's that that is how it felt uh, for me, like a combining pressure that, okay, you haven't done the work yet. And then the, the second part of yourself telling yourself like, okay, you can't do it because you're sick <laughs> and having to accept that. And I felt really bad because I felt like, you know, how many thousand people were subscribed at the time? I don't know, 5,000 something. Um, I was like, 5,000 people are waiting for you to publish tomorrow. How can you tell them that you're sick? (laughs) And then um, one of the things I was telling myself was like, okay, maybe they're going to be like, okay, well, you didn't publish today. Maybe you should have hired someone to write. And then this wouldn't have happened. And I was thinking of all those kinds of negative things. Um, So instead of not publishing, what I did was I just created a sort of, bare bones version of the newsletter i just put an intro saying that i feel pretty sick and i won't be writing and that i don't know if it's covid yet um and then i just added a couple of links from around the web about news that people can read on southeast asian startups while i couldn't write about anything else and when i woke up the next day there were so many emails from people saying like oh you should rest or oh i love the newsletter take care so i actually didn't feel so bad afterwards anymore um because when i woke up there were so many kind emails from people reading um, that they just wanted me to get well. They're actually happy that I get to rest or they said maybe it's a sign that you need some rest <laughs> and things like that. So I think it was a really interesting experience actually. Now, this is really interesting because I think the fact that people are responding and I mean, the in- initial reaction for anyone when you when they don't get what they want is they get upset and then they start yeah. saying stuff and they complain. The fact that people are coming back to you and saying like, hey, you should rest, this is great. It actually shows that you're creating a community that's in some way following you and a lot of things that you do because people, I think what people think about newsletters is that kind of soulless thing where someone's just pumping out information like, you know, hey, buy this product. Hey, our company is the greatest. Well, what you're doing is you're actually creating communities around you, which is kind of important and kind of leads me to the next question. Dave, sorry, I'm going to, I'm going to jump in for this one. So uh, you, you'll take over the, take over the next question. Sorry about that, but I kind of want to know the role that LinkedIn has played and kind of what your, why, first of all, why choose LinkedIn? Secondly, do you have any tips for anyone who kind of wants to grow communities through LinkedIn? Because I think you've done that quite successfully, right? You're very active. I follow your LinkedIn. I've seen everything you're posting. I think LinkedIn is great. I just wish people would stop posting like these random, really random stuff about, I don't know, like stealing (laughs) people's ideas and posting things there. That's weird. But I, 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 I like people to create good content and put things there that actually I can take something from, right? Um, so yeah, how, how do you, like, first of all, like why LinkedIn? And secondly, like, um, how, do you have any tips for anyone who wants to kind of grow communities? 
I guess like why LinkedIn, I think started with me not knowing what to focus on in the first place. So I just tried everything. Um, and then at one point I just started looking at, okay, this is what I did this week. Um, these are the things I did a bit more this week. Um, and I started realizing that I was getting the most returns from LinkedIn. Um, the most interesting kinds of subscribers, um, the more returns, depending on the amount of effort I put. So I told myself, okay, um, it's a sign that LinkedIn is the one that's working the most. Because there was a point when we um, we were running back scoop, you know, August to, I think, December, early December. We never published anywhere. It was just me publishing the newsletter and that was it. We didn't publish on Facebook, Twitter, anywhere. But then suddenly when we started publishing on LinkedIn, I think in December, we were actually getting traffic um, in from places that, you know, we didn't even have presence in like Indonesian people were starting to subscribe. Um, Singaporean people were starting to subscribe. And I think that was also one of the bigger signs that I saw. Um, but I think for anyone, depending on what kind of thing that you're putting out, like what kind of book, what kind of newsletter, what kind of content you're putting out, you just have to ask yourself like one, what is the channel that is well providing the most returns and quality returns, depending on the amount of effort that you're putting in. And two, it's like, where is your audience? I think, you know, as a tech newsletter, I know that a lot of people um, in the tech scene are active on LinkedIn. So it's a great place to be because how else are you going to target those specific people on Facebook or let's say on Twitter? It's not it's not as easy. OK, no, that's really good. How, but how? so do you have any tips for kind of growing that community, though? Like it, it's you, you've done really, really well and it's only been like less than a year. How do you how do you grow how do you grow that community? I think for every community there are totally different ways to grow it. I think for me I inadvertently grew it perhaps by um at the start of running Backscoop, I would reach out to people subscribing and I'd be like, Hey, welcome to Backscoop and I'd introduce myself. And sometimes I'd email them saying, like, Hey, do you want to get on a call and could I get a few of your thoughts on Backscoop? And that's what I did with a lot of the early um, readers on Backscoop as well. Um, I just reached out to say hello um, and then got to know them over a call, got their feedback. And I think that helped. Um, but truthfully speaking, um, over time, like it's not that I get, got on a call with every single person, but I think it's probably that as well as part of the newsletter, sometimes it, um, you share a bit about your day or a bit about your life sometimes. I don't think I do that every day, but sometimes I inject a bit of my personal life into, let's say, the intro. I think when I told other people that I started a new hobby, um, maybe that's a bit of personality and community building in a sense. Um, apart from that, I think I'm also just really, um, I guess I spend a lot of time looking into the details. So sometimes I just check in, okay, who subscribed today? And let's say I already know that person. I'll be like, oh, hey, um, this is my newsletter, et cetera, et cetera. Or let's say the person subscribed and um, we covered their company. I will send them an email and say like, hey, thanks for subscribing. We actually covered your company a couple of weeks ago. Things like that. Um, I think those are the ways we have grown it inadvertently. And maybe those are similar methods that people can use if they'd like. Yeah, no, I, I like I like the thing where you said you were you were data driven. I think that's really important. I think a lot of people aren't. They're not really looking at the numbers. They're not looking at the the metrics, or they don't understand what it is. I, I pay a lot of attention. To... Sorry for interrupting you. <laughs> oh, that's super important. That's really that's really really important. I mean, I the fact that more people don't do it is kind of surprising to me most of the time. Like like Dave's Dave's from digital marketing. I I, I have a marketing PR background, so like. Understanding, looking at the data is really, really, really important. The fact that people don't kind of surprise me. You can like leverage the data you have as a newsletter. Like for example, with the with the for example the subscriber list, you can look at people's companies. You can take notice. Um, okay, what kind of companies are subscribing now? Um, where are these people coming from? Sometimes, if you just pay close attention, you'll see a somebody that you just met last week, and you'll be like, oh, they actually subscribed, and you can reach out, or you can look into the subscriber list and you'll see it's a friend of another friend. So you can reach out again. Um, things like that. I think there are a lot of opportunities for you to reach out to people um, and just be nice to people. 
just because you notice something about their email or just because you notice something about their LinkedIn. Already, I can't do that. Just being nice to people. No. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's really hard for them to, to say nice things. But I like what you said about how how you get input from other people. That really helped me out when I was coming up with my book of illustrations. When I, when I got people to give me constructive feedback on things, like the, the, my initial, the initial product I had in mind came out very differently and much better thanks to people's feedback. Plus, it got them invested in what I was doing, which uh, worked wonders. I've got to ask you about LinkedIn, though. What kind of posts do well for you? Because I know if you, if you go to LinkedIn and you just start saying stuff, it won't necessarily mean success or high engagement or high click rates. What has helped you get more engagement and you know what kind of posts help you get more newsletter subscribers? I think like it sounds cheesy, but and I think everything that I've been doing is really just being myself. So example for for example, like looking into people's emails and just like emailing them hi, that's just part of my personality. Or just like seeing somebody's email pop up and I saw that it's the same person with a different email, I'll say hi again and say, like, oh, you changed your job congratulations on the new role or something like that. It's just like something that I would normally do. Um, and with LinkedIn, it's the same. So I think I just started posting on LinkedIn as a one-off whim. I think people were asking me how to grow a newsletter. So I decided to make a few posts on it and just share my experience. And then a few other times, some people had asked me before, like, oh, why don't you, you ever write more about you on Backscoop? I said, oh, because... Backscoop is a newsletter for, you know, Southeast Asia tech news. It's not about me. And so since people were asking me to share a bit more about myself, I decided to write a bit more about some experiences that I've had um, joining the tech scene and some experiences running Backscoop. I share them on LinkedIn. So I think it's a mix of just, you know, sharing things that like I like to share or I think are kind of interesting. But more importantly, like I share the things that people ask me to share um, and can't share on like Mac Scoop as well. And those I think have worked the best. I think the posts that have gotten the most uh, reactions have been like times when I shared the experience running Mac Scoop. Actually, mm, that's interesting. I think because you you kind of give them insight into what you're doing, right? Yeah, and I think like the 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 impact. So I think the first post that I ever had that had like three hundred or four hundred likes, it was just really short, like maybe nine lines or less. Um, And it basically outlined like after running Backscoop, these are the things that happen. Like people make friends, people get intros to investors, people meet other founders, um, people are able to make partnerships happen. I think it was a post like that. And it was just me, you know, compiling a few of the things that people have shared to me about like, thanks to the newsletter, they found a new job or they closed a partnership deal or they got... Um, interviewed by a VC or they met another founder or something like that. Awesome. No, that, that's fascinating. That's, that's fascinating because I think authenticity is, we, we always talk about being authentic, right? And just kind of like sharing who you are, sharing your, your true self and, and kind of being open and vulnerable on, on social media platforms. Even businesses kind of need to do that a little bit. What I've found is, at least in in my experience, is nobody does that. I mean, we, we say we're vulnerable. We we talk about things that are technically vulnerable, but it's not really authentic. I I'll, I'll give an example. I'm not going to name names because I think that's quite bad. But I actually I work with someone who put the who puts up Instagram. Oh, sorry, LinkedIn updates and LinkedIn posts about issues they're facing in their business. I know for a fact this person is doing completely fine because we work quite closely on some stuff. Just, I don't want to call say bullshit, but it's primarily bullshit. And it's, it's what I accused Dave of, of earlier, right? Trying to get sympathy, sympathy <laughs> engagement from people, just like feeling sorry for him a little bit. I, it's a little bit of that. And I don't understand why, because I'm like, that's not authentic. First of all, that engagement is bullshit in, in any way because you can't use it for anything. Secondly, you're not using you're not using LinkedIn for anything other than pandering to your, I don't know, some weird, uh, some weird need. I, I spoke to this person about this to their face, uh, like, like for some weird need or something. Like it 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 has no business goal whatsoever. So I, I never understood 
um, why people do a lot of these things that, that aren't real. If you don't have issues, talk about something else. Just talk about other cool things that you're doing. But then you get to the opposite side of the spectrum, right? What, what most of so like no, I'd say ninety percent of social media is where well, things are good when they really they aren't. Most of social media, mm-hmm. most of LinkedIn shows a lot of happiness and joy and success, but really. It's just all sadness. It's, just, it's not sad. It's, 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 it's a lot of reality. It's really yeah. unhappy. Yeah. But yeah, Dave, like, you're really negative. <laughs> you're super optimistic. Dave's just like, no, everyone's unhappy. No, but I think social media, especially LinkedIn, you a lot of people need to bury who they really are because potential employers are on there, potential business partners are on there. That's just my, what I think. I think it's Maybe. always like a mix, like of like you struggle. Like if you put too many optimistic or good things, that people might think you're bragging, or people might think you're not being authentic. At the same time, if you, um, I guess, like complain or you just share hardships, like you might look like you're trying to beg for sympathy points, or um, maybe it's also not me. real, right? So I think, regardless of whatever spectrum you're on, I feel like you know just share what you want to share and what you're okay with sharing <laughs> because at the end of oh, the day dear. at both extremes right you might seem fake to some sort of people but at the end of the day i think there will be like a group of people who will um like Appreciate. what you're posting yeah yeah that's, that's why tong has his private only fans where he can truly be himself <laughs> i subscribe to it i'm his only subscriber i show my friendship through that <laughs> he's only the one who watches all the videos as well uh, <laughs> um, no I don't have an OnlyFans just, just in case anyone's really wondering uh, secondly yeah no um, thanks Dave you completely threw me off I, have a question. I had a real question for you man and I apologize Dave just completely threw me off with his stupid OnlyFans oh <laughs> uh, Okay, wait, wait, wait. No, I do have a question. I do have a question. Okay, so this is this is coming back to back to people a little bit. Thanks, Dave. Just never ever say anything like that. Uh, <laughs> coming back to back to people, right? So you said like you you reach out to some of the people who who um, subscribe, and then you have like VCs, founders, etc. That that are um, that are uh, subscribing to your uh, newsletter. Have you ever have you ever like spoken to someone on like? had a conversation with someone like 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 decent size of big entrepreneurs did you get anything like really interesting from them because i work with entrepreneurs all the time what i found out is they have their personalities tend to be very different they tend to have something very very i don't want to say like something's wrong with them but there is something slightly wrong with them a lot of the time um, Do you think there's yeah, something I, wrong with me? <laughs> that means I'm, I'm not real. Yeah, I can, I can say I can say this 100 percent from like from personal experience. There is something wrong because the payoff is huge, but it's extremely high risk, a ton of work. So the ROI, if even if you exit, right, you make you make a you, you make a million bucks, which is good money, right? You make a million dollars, but you had to give up years of your life, like. Right? The, is the ROI really there? But as a as an entrepreneur, you aren't really thinking about it. You're just thinking about how the hell do I crush this? Absolutely scale my company, and the exit comes later. Whenever you feel like it, when you when you you've spoken to people, uh, maybe you've, you've interviewed them or you you've had conversations with them in, in your time. Did you notice? Did you did you ever like meet someone who was just so different that you kind of got a lot from them, or you like you were like, oh, this guy's this guy goes nuts. I think there are always like different kinds of founders, especially when you look at, okay, what does the first time founder look like? Second time, third time founder look like, Mm -hmm. or a founder who was previously an executive at a big company. I think they're all like a bit different, but I think um, a common thing I see is there's an insane work ethic, um, especially among those who are pushing really hard um, as first time founders. I think that's what I've seen with a lot of first time founders who have been really good about what they are doing. They have an insane work ethic, um, like crazy long hours. They can run a little sleep, but obviously they want to sleep as well, right? But they're willing to put themselves at limits that they've never seen themselves go to before just to, you know, try to achieve some greater 
goal, right? And I think that's that's something really interesting about these people. Um, they're willing to put themselves at physical limits, I guess mental limits as well, just to really try hard to see, can they achieve this goal? Can they help the team achieve this goal? And it's not usually just in the service of themselves. It's as if like, you know, this is something totally above and beyond that they want to try to achieve. Interesting. Would you say that you fall into that category as well? I think every entrepreneur is different in a sense. I think for me, um, I think for me, I kind of am similar in a sense that like I, I work pretty long hours. I think a lot of people have tried to dissuade me, especially because I'm young. And, you know, obviously they have, they have good intentions. But for me, I feel like, you know, you really enjoy um, the day to day. Like, I, I think I got like three, four hours of sleep last night, incidentally. Um, not This is not my usual like amount of sleep, but like I'm still here. I'm still rolling with my day and I'm pretty, pretty much in a good mood because I feel like you look at everything as a really fun process. And you want to just see, can you actually achieve this goal? How big can this actually get? And it's as if it's like just a very fun marathon to, to be on. And it's like you're challenging yourself every day. Like, okay, can I do it? Um, and at the same time, like all of those limits that you set yourself to before, it's as if you can tell yourself, like, maybe you can actually push them um, again and again. But I'm not trying to, you know... Um, push for an unhealthy lifestyle. I don't think it's about that. I think it's it's different from hustle culture, I think. Yeah. If you look hustle at fun. how these people I was, live. I was about to say hustle mm -hmm. fun. Yeah. yeah, I think it's different from hustle culture. It's not like saying that, okay, you should always not sleep and you should always just put yourself at limits. I think it's just the mindset of like, how far can you push yourself? How can you achieve this goal? And that excitement about the whole process of trying to get there. That is probably the most uh, inspirational thing I've heard all week, <laughs> which is which is interesting, and, and it made me reflect on a lot of things. I remember back, like a, this is probably before you were born, Amanda. Like when they said there's something. You're making yourself sound like you're, you're 80, man. <laughs> yeah, we're old, yeah so, it sounds like yeah, you're we're like. Almost 80. Double, we're almost double Amanda's age, man. Admit it. I know it's really, really, <laughs> really fucking frustrating. <laughs> yeah. But, oh. It, what, I remember they were saying they were talking about this technology called GPS. I was thinking that would that's impossible. You can't you can't have detail detail like detail on of streets of every street like with all construction everything's that's impossible. And for them to create technology like that that takes some kind of the like, crazy entrepreneurial spirit, right? Things that will make like just bend reality. I think I think it is. Like, I think it's amazing. I've never heard of the GPS example in my life. But because I love it, but it's so it's different. like we accept it as normal today. But imagine, like, how could you? I couldn't even think how that was possible, right? Yeah. I mean, okay, you could use the fact that we're having a conversation in real time across three across thousands yeah. of miles in three countries on video. And we're recording in HD. That's a miracle. <laughs> imagine like we, the, we take the, for granted every day. <laughs> imagine the sacrifice that took to happen. How many people got fired, laid off? How many people got sleepless <laughs> nights? Yeah. How many divorces it cost to, to do this right now? Right? Yeah. Well, a, lot, a lot. <laughs> yeah. A lot. A lot. A lot of I'm people noticing. who believe in the power yeah. of it. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. No. The the tech scene. The tech scene is just rife for. Uh, marital issues, is divorces and stuff like that. Hashtag That's what I've noticed. Yeah. <laughs> everyone, How many everyone. tech billionaires are still married, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, one. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg. Huh? Who else? Oh, yeah, I, think Zuck I think it's only him. <laughs> yeah, but Zuck's got married the most recent, right? Everyone else, like, give, give him a few years. I mean, <laughs> hopefully it doesn't happen. No, he's stuck with her since... Um... Since high school, since college, right? He's been with her before he, he was huge. Yeah, and Musk was with his wife for like 10, 15 years, and then he became rich, got his hair back, and he's like, he's now he's like, now he's bye. Like, bye. <laughs> <laughs> Musk? No, Musk is fat, man. Oh, Be oh, so I was thinking of Bezos. Oh, Bezos, yeah, Bezos, Bezos is buff, yeah. Uh, he, I don't think he cares anymore about like Amazon. He's just like, I'm rich. Uh, <laughs> okay, I think we got sidetracked there slightly. So. <laughs> <laughs> Amanda, so we, we actually do this thing in every podcast. So um, you mentioned that you read a lot of books, right? 
could you mm-hmm. give us the top three books that you read that kind of inspired you or, or you got the most from that you would recommend to other people? I think what I'll share, like the books that I was reading when I was just starting in the tech scene slash starting as like a founder, the first book that I read when I was getting into tech, um, right before my job interview was The Lean Startup. Um, okay. I think oh, everybody has read that, but I think it was a great intro book to the, the world of startups. Um, I think another set of books that are interesting is um, Mindset by Carol Dweck. And I'd read Mindset. that in tandem. Yeah. I'd read that in tandem with Daring Greatly by mm-hmm. Brené Brown. I think it just helps a lot um, with how much you have to stretch your mind and your growth and you have to develop that per- growth mindset when you're working at a startup stash, being a founder. So I think those two books, I mean, those two sets of books. And I think the third book um, is Young China by Zach Dietwald. I think it doesn't seem related to startups, but I think it's more tied to how I view the startup scene. So what not a lot of people might know is that I was a massive nerd about like China. I learned about like Chinese um, politics, um, Chinese history, but most importantly, I think contemporary China. For me, what was most interesting about China was how they you know, grew to such a developed economy from what they were. And for me, what I took away from that as a, as a kid was like, if they can do that in China, imagine, you know, what would it take for that to happen in my country or in Southeast Asia? And I would love to see, you know, that kind of economic growth, that kind of, you know, um, level of growth for the people in each country in Southeast Asia as well. You know, that kind of prosperity. I think that was a great example. And I w- I was wanted to see like, okay, what would that look like in Southeast Asia? And I feel like, you know, startups and, you know, business in general are a great way to help, you know, change a lot of people's mm-hmm. lives. That's great. I've always been looking yeah. for a book about how China started and how they did it. I yeah, think we, for, love, we love China as yeah. well. Because when they, <laughs> when, they take, when they take over the world, I want them to listen to the recording and know that we were supporters <laughs> even before. I think Young China it's, it's is more of, about like contemporary China, like everybody born in the 1990s onwards. But I think what's fun about reading it is that you see the difference in the new generation between the old one. And that's why I really like, you know, the story of like how you know, how, I guess, you can actually change a country and impact so many people's lives in so many more ways than just, you know, one. I'm, I'm putting that on my list of things to read. It sounds really interesting because I think the history of the kind of modern day China is not yeah. seen in the right way. So it's a little bit too closed off. I think. It, it, I think it's interesting because you'll see like, it's not just like that they get a better education, that they're, you know, taller and et cetera, because they're not malnourished. It's like they literally think in totally different ways. And I think that's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's not only really that they're getting, actually, I wouldn't say their nutrition is better. They're just getting more food. Have you seen the little fat Chinese kids that run around <laughs> on all the documentaries about all the fat camps? Like, it's, it's fascinating. I, I watched all of those. It was, a fat camp, is that for them to lose weight or to gain weight? Uh, lose weight. So it's literally there was an obesity problem in China because fast food was so prevalent that there are actually camps, government sponsored camps that parents enroll their fat kids in in order to lose weight. I didn't even know so, about that. <laughs> yeah, no, because they were they, so so many of these kids were morbidly obese, and we're talking like almost hundreds of thousands. We're not talking like oh, a hundred kids. No, it's hundreds of thousands of kids across China, which is morbidly obese that they had to do something because they were worried about losing a generation of people with diabetes and stuff. It's a, it's a bit, it's a bit, they, China goes kind of all the way. They, they don't, they don't take half measures. They're like, ah, oh, fat camp. <laughs> no, edu- no educational programs for you. Fat camp. <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's true. I can say it. I can say it. I'm Chinese. I can say it. Tugs a graduate. <laughs> no man, I, I needed to go after after um, COVID though. I needed to go after COVID, and it's gone better now. Um, <laughs> um, Dave, you got you got a question, for Amanda? Yeah, to close off, Amanda, I was wondering you you deal with a lot of business people, and also you you're running your own successful business, right? What are in your vast life, right? As a twenty year old <laughs> entrepreneur, <laughs> what, what are like some key business lessons you've learned? throughout this time? I think that there's a lot of 
work that goes hidden behind the scenes. In the early days, it's a lot of manual work, boring work. Um, but later on, I think as a founder, you have a lot of things that you know the, the rest of the team won't see, a lot of the other people won't see. And I think knowing that and understanding that is helpful to you know relieve a lot of the weight off your shoulders. Because you know if you go every day thinking, oh, nobody appreciates my work, or oh, I do so much hard work. But when you realize it's part of the process, I think it makes things a lot lighter for you. Um, the second thing is like a quote that somebody was telling me a lot when I was studying in the tech scene. It's that, you know, if you take care of the work, it will take care of you. One of my um, problems that I had when I was working in the tech scene, especially as a high school graduate, I was really excited about working in the tech scene. I was really working hard and I was kind of pretty much set on, I was pretty much set on just working here for the next few years. And especially when I started my own company, people were like, okay, um, do you ever think of going back to college? Don't you think you'll have more opportunities? Or maybe you wouldn't lose your job um, if you actually went to college, maybe at the same time or just foregoed everything and went to college. I think like for me, um, I tried not to listen to those things and tried to work harder and, you know, since then, it's been interesting. People have been offering me jobs that now I can't, I mean, I can't take because I'm running my own thing, right? So you take care of the mm-hmm. work, it takes care of you. <laughs> and yeah, no, let me try to think of the third one. I think, I think the third key business thing is that it's a mix of learning and unlearning. So it's a whole process where you have to unlearn a few things about maybe the industry or yourself or other people. And then you have to continuously keep learning because the kinds of tasks that you're going to do, um, the industry, um, what you'll need to be are always going to change. So just remember that it's a mix of learning and unlearning all the time. And that there's always something that you're going to have to leave behind. I think Happiness. Things. <laughs> joy. Sleep. Family. Sleep. Everything. Please. Just joy in general. Just joy. Joy. Any, any any meaningful relationship? <laughs> uh, usual stuff. Usual stuff. Usual stuff. Uh, uh, no, that, that's that's really good. I mean, I I really like the fact that you're you're getting job offers now because you didn't go to school, but they're actually seeing you take something. It's very odd. Like I, I'm I'm actually a massive proponent of I'd rather have people with experience than people with qualification. Because qualification is great, but experience is actually, to me, is tried and tested. You, if you have experience, if you know how to do something, I want you doing the thing I need you to do. So it's, it's all, that's always kind of been my, my type of thing. Or you take someone really young and fresh and you, you train them and you mold them into I think being some, perfect. I, I think, I'm curious, have you ever done that uh, for any of your team members? Like, did you ever really try to train anybody um, who was super fresh, oh. super new? My, most of my team has been super fresh. Like, so we actually have a, I wouldn't say we have a great training program, but we've got a training, it's trial by fire. So it's just thrown in and like, hey, do the work. I'll check on you next week. Uh, no, I'm joking. We actually have a proper process of training. Everybody kind of, everyone has to go and learn um, the pure basics first of not about doing marketing up here, but actually a basics of what it is to run a company, what is to understand what drives business owners and what it is that drives really, really specific consumer behavior. What makes people want to purchase things? What makes people want to uh, change their mind? What makes people want to try things that are new? Because everything else you can kind of learn faster, like this actual skill set to do PR and marketing, you can learn. If you don't understand the basics that actually kind of make the wheels turn from a business perspective, from a consumer perspective, then it doesn't matter if your skill set's really high, you don't know how to actually utilize it properly. So we try and train them on that part first and then the skills that'll come naturally. They'll just come with a little bit of experience. That's, that's, that's how we do it. And that's how I do it in, in my company. Uh, it's, I wouldn't say it's the best, but it works for us. It, Got it, it. It's, it's different. It's different. The way Dave does it is, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to spill any secrets, but Dave just, <laughs> Dave just doesn't hire anybody. He just like works by himself, just alone. No, but when, when when I was a co-owner of, of our company, it's it's a huge it's so different in theory than in practice. Like when you have people reporting to you, it's insane. Like it's everyone is different. Um, they all have different needs, and then you also have to make sure you can feed them and motivate them. It's it's a it's a whole different ball game. Like uh, it is insane. Like I, I I don't miss it. 
I don't miss it's managing It's not like having work. children. Yeah, <laughs> you <definitely. laughs> feed them more food. <laughs> yeah, you gotta feed them, man. You gotta. Come, you... come on, Timmy. Eat your broccoli. Why is she eating your broccoli? I don't. I don't miss it. Because like you, you, you can hold like company events and stuff, but they probably don't like going there anyway. Like you, oh, you yeah, can't... yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, no, anyway. like no. So when when Dave was running his his agency, like he would just call me and or he'd text me and just say like how how great things are going. And also just like I just hate everything. He just talked about <laughs> how much how unhappy. So it's just like all right, okay, cool. So it's like it's going great. Like we did this, or like we got we got new clients. I'm like, oh, it's awesome. He's like, I hate my life. I'm just what the fuck? <laughs> it's complete one eighty to talking to Dave. But anyway, uh, we need some of Amanda's positivity. Yeah, we know we do. You, you, you've been the most positive person we've ever had on the podcast. Yeah. We've had really negative people. Or we've had like really people who are super neutral. You're the most positive person we've ever right. had. It's, it's great. And then I hope you continue yeah. that on. It's just great. It, I mean, it, it makes us money. look really, really, really dull in comparison. Maybe you can interview me in five years and just do like a like a check. Like how much yeah. more or less positive uh, I am. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Man, you'll just, you'll just be broken. You'll just be broken by the industry. <laughs> you'll just be like, you know, I hate everything. But I you'll, you'll have a Mercedes. <laughs> <laughs> oh. yeah. And then if I'm sad at that time, I'll be like, but I only have one. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. All the time. <laughs> exactly. You'll, you'll just become Bezos or something. You're just like, you know, we must do this. And you want to you buy everything in the Philippines. But I mean, uh, we'll, 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 let's give you the last word, Amanda. Why don't you t- why don't you tell everybody like uh, what they can expect from Backscoop, and then we'll, we'll we'll put all the show notes and everything. We'll put the link in the show notes and stuff. Well, I mean, what everyone can expect from Backscoop is every day when they wake up in the morning, they can get an email where they can keep up with Southeast Asian tech in a super easy way. You can read the whole email in like less than seven minutes, and in those seven minutes. You haven't even finished your coffee, but you've already kept up with the latest news in Southeast Asian tech from the past one, two days. And you don't even need to check any other tech news sites. You don't have to check your feed because we've got you covered for the day. And whatever happens for the rest of the day, you're going to see it on the newsletter tomorrow. So for the latest news in Southeast Asian tech, you can subscribe for free on www.backscoop.com. Dude, that was the best elevator um, pitch I've ever heard. And, and, um, if they want to follow you on LinkedIn, it's just Amanda Cool, all right? Amanda, and then that's CUA. Yeah. Uh, but we'll put the link to our LinkedIn on our show notes anyway. Yep. And we'll we'll awesome. tag Backscoop on all social media and everything. So anyone who wants to subscribe, please do. It's free. You don't have to worry about anything. Amanda will give you money. Just, just do it. She's going to give you cryptocurrency. <laughs> just make sure you do it. It's a lot of money. You're going to give them uh, cryptocurrency because I didn't tell okay, you to but... say that. <laughs> <laughs> I She's not going to use cryptocurrency. <laughs> uh, NFTs. <no>. Okay. <laughs> Just NFTs and stuff. Um, no, no, but and subscribe to Backscoop. Uh, go to backscoop.com. Uh, it's really awesome. You can subscribe really easily, and every single day you'll get newsletters. David, have you subscribed? I'm going to. You <laughs> I know your email's not there. there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, I have. I have, I yeah, have. I know, I've, I've, I know I've, he I've, has. I've, yeah, I've got right. about seven different But you emails. don't even know my email, Amanda. Yeah, let me subscribe right now. It would be unethical <laughs> for me to copy, paste, and subscribe for you. <laughs> uh, but you, that's hey, how Amanda, David gets all the subscribers. Speaking of ethics, <laughs> uh, we, we're going to subscribe you to our newsletter right now. <laughs> <laughs> I do that for every guest. <laughs> every guest gets a newsletter, which we send out once or twice a month. So subscribe more. to our newsletter too, everyone. Anyone who's listening and watching. Yeah, yeah, Dave, why don't you take us out, man? And then I'll the um, once again, Amanda, thank you so much for your time. I, I definitely learned a lot. I hope our viewers and listeners do too. Uh, for anyone who's listening in for the first time, don't forget to follow us. It will mean a lot. We'll we'll keep. Uh, it will help us keep bringing great guests like Amanda. Check us out on everything. We'll just search business over drinks. We're pretty much in every social media channel. So see you all. Love you very much. Oh, 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 oh,